Good morning. Welcome and thank you for joining us here today. Whether you are in Decora physically with us or joining us virtually, it is absolutely wonderful to have you here. It is such an honor today to welcome Her Excellency, Minister of Foreign Affairs for the Kingdom of Norway, Anakin Pietfeldt, to Luther College. We welcome her along with other members of the foreign ministry in Oslo. And also, it is our great honor to welcome Ambassador Anakin Krutnes, along with staff from the Royal Norwegian Embassy in Washington, DC. My name is Maren Johnson, and I serve as the director of the Torgerson Center for Nordic Studies here at Luther. As the first college founded by Norwegian immigrants, we are proud of, it, of our heritage for it affords us linkages to Norway today, for our students to explore, for our faculty and staff to study, and for our community to connect. As the only endowed Nordic Studies program in the United States, we seek to build the premier undergraduate Nordic Studies program in North America. And we cannot do that alone. It is the relationships that create excellence, and today is another momentous occasion to solidify and celebrate the connection between Norway and Luther College. Our speaker today has a distinguished CV. Mr. Hutfeldt was appointed Minister of Foreign Affairs on October 14, 2021. The Minister of Foreign Affairs is responsible for Norwegian foreign policy, the promotion of Norway's interests internationally, and the Foreign Service, which includes more than 100 embassies, permanent missions and delegations, and consulates general. Ms. Hutved comes from Yesheim, Norway, and has a master's degree with specialization in history. She has been particularly engaged in efforts to promote security policy, equality, and climate throughout her career. She was elected to the Norwegian Storting, the Norwegian Parliament, in 2005, and has been a member since then. She has held several positions within the Norwegian government. She was Minister of Children and Equality from 2008 to 2009, Minister of Culture from 2009 to 2012, Minister of Labor from 2012 to 2013, and from 2013 to 2021, she chaired the Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs and Defense in the Parliament. On behalf of all of us gathered here today, Tusen Tak, Minister Biesfeldt. Thank you for sharing your time and your thoughts with us today. She will provide remarks about Norwegian issue, foreign policy initiatives, and following her remarks, there will be time for questions. So without further ado, please help me in extending a warm Decora and Luther welcome to Her Excellency, Minister Anakin Friedfeldt. Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Johnson, for your welcoming words. I'm so excited to be here, and I'm very pleased to be invited, because this college was founded by Norwegian for more than 160 years ago, and its first president was Peter Laurentius Larsen, Lower Larsen. He was born in the town of Kristiansand in the southern part of Norway back in 18, 1833. When he grew up, Norway was among the poorest countries in Europe, and very many left for America. Some of them returned home, but the majority of them settled here in this new land, most of them in the Midwest, looking for opportunities and a better life, such as Nils Johnson Korsa from Hedal in Telmark. He left Norway in 18. And eventually settled in Winnicheck County, Iowa. He ended up as a pastor here in the Cora. And I can imagine the young Nils Corsa sitting on the top of the hill in his native Telemark. 
before he left for the US, looking out over his village, the valleys and the countryside. And what he saw then was mostly misery, poverty. He saw people with small or no chances of social mobility. If you were born then, born poor, you were, would almost certainly become poor like your parents. He couldn't see any future, no hope. Then I can imagine the same Nils Kosa sitting on the top of the same hill in Telemark today, looking out of the same village, valleys and countryside. What would he have seen then? How would he then have reacted? He would have seen pretty much of the same, same landscape, but a completely different country. He would see a country with opportunities prosperity, hope. He would see people with equal chances of social mobility, whether they were born, born rich or poor, urban or rural, black or white, girls or boys. Educated people with all possibilities in the world to pursue for a better life. Now, Norway is not unique in that sense. Very many European countries come where people emigrated from, and perhaps, particular in the Nordics, have been through a similar, I would say, transformation, from poverty to prosperity. And although there are many reasons and explanations for that journey, the most important one, I would say, can be summed up with one word, trust. Trust between people, Trust between rulers and those who are ruled. Trust in government due to trust in the system of governance. And I will also like to add trust between nations. You know, in my office in Oslo, I have a paper written by the US State Department. Well, I, I probably have many papers written by the State Department, but this is very special. It is entitled Proposal for Expansion of World Trade and Employment and is dated November 1945. Only three months after the end of the most destructive war the world has ever seen. And the first line of this paper states that the main price of Allied victory is the power to establish a new world order. And in, this, in the next sentence, it states that the fundamental choice is whether countries will struggle against each other for wealth and power or work together for security and mutual advantage. The ideas that those sentences express are what fostered the world order since 1945. These are ideas of American origin, ideas which fostered international institutions such as United Nations, World Trade Organization, and human rights institutions. In all times before 1945, wars of conquest were for many states a main mean, means of conducting foreign policy. For instance, between 1816 and 1945, a state disappeared on average every three years. With the adoption of the UN Charter and international law, ban on warfare was established, and this has worked. In the entire post-war period, wars of conquest have hardly occurred. Prior to February um, 2022, last year with the Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, more than 30 years had passed. That was when um, Saddam Hussein's I Iraq tried to invade Ku 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 Kuwait and by then tried to change the, the map. But this happened very seldom after the Second World War. So trust, I would say, is a key between nations and in nations. Trust is a resource that can make humans capable of cooperation. What Professor Robert Putnam at Harvard refers to as social capital, in societies with a high degree of trust, 
there is a sense of shared fate, a sense of common interests, that we all are in the same boat, heading in the same direction. Compared to most other countries, Norway and other Nordic countries have a relatively low degree of economic disparity. Economic inequalities are less now than 400 years ago. At the same time, the level of trust is higher today than 100 years ago. And there is, in my opinion, a very clear connection. This development has removed barriers and also made social mobility possible so that anyone who is willing to work hard can pursue their ideas and succeed regardless of their background. So education is a precondition for social mobility. The possibility to get an education is so important. Education has provided my country with enormous wealth because knowledge is what made it possible for us to extract oil and gas from the North Sea Basin to produce electricity from our waterfalls and also to cultiv uh, cultivate salmon in our fjords and also to design world-class uh, world ships. The examples are very many. Today, Norway is a nation with almost endless opportunities. It would not have been possible without education knowledge. And knowledge is also what will take us through the next big transformation to a sustainable, non-fossil green economy. Because the climate crisis, we are in the midst of a green energy transition. A transition that has accelerated due to Russia's war in Ukraine. As Russian gas export to Europe has come to an halt, today that export is almost zero from Russia to other European countries. So the green energy transformation is at the top of Norway's foreign policy agenda. We are now the biggest exporter of oil and gas to Europe. Two years ago, that was Russia. And in the transformative years ahead, we will continue to provide much needed energy to Europe and beyond. But the, boy, the world now, the globe now, is boiling. Temperatures are rising. And nowhere on the planet it is more visible than in the Arctic, an area where Norway and the United States have very strong common interests. So the green shift is a game changer, but a game changer that reflects opportunities for us in areas such as offshore wind, hydrogen, zero emission transport, battery technology, minerals, and also carbon capture and storage. And this is highly interesting because in empty oil fields in and under the seabed, we now capture CO2 emissions from industry and store it in solid rock. So this is new technology. The United States is Norway's most important economic partner outside Europe. And the green shift will create, in my opinion, opportunities and jobs on both sides of the Atlantic. And among my priorities is to secure an even closer cooperation um, in the, this green shift between our two nations. By solving the climate crisis and managing the green transition, it's not something any country can do on its own, not even the United States. The climate crisis is a global prob problem and we need global solutions. We need to work together. So, dear students, it is not a small burden that we, my generation and grandparents, have placed on your shoulders in the years ahead. Climate changes are real and they are our own making, which means that we are the ones who must fix our faults, or you must fix our faults, and make sure that solution we find today will not create the problems of tomorrow. 
it will be another giant step for mankind. But we have conquered challenges before, often with United States at the helm. And I'm confident that we will do this again with skills, with brains, and uh, with hope. Hope. During the dark years of war in Europe in the 1940s, a message of hope was sent from the Midwest to the people of Norway. In May 1942, during the Nazi occupation of my country, the Norwegian Prime Minister visited the United States. Among other places, he was actually here at Luther College. And then he returned to London, where the Norwegian government stayed during the war, and he gave a radio speech, illegally broadcasted throughout Norway. In that speech, he talked about his impression from his visit to the United States. And he concluded with the following words. The battle will be long. It will be hard. And it will demand great sacrifices. But it must and will be won because the United States will never give up until we have won a complete victory over the en enemies of liberty and civilization. Beautiful words. Today we are once again fighting enemies of liberty and civilization in Europe through the war in Ukraine, where a Russian victory would eliminate Ukraine from the map. The Ukrainians do the fighting and suffer the most, but this war is about something more than Ukraine. It concerns the right for any country to make their own decisions, to choose their own way. As we chose ours as founding members of NATO 1949. The war in Ukraine is a war against a brutal authoritarian regime, a fight for democratic rules and individual rights, and a fight for international law and rules that have framed international cooperation since the end of the Second World War. All of this is now at stake, and we cannot allow that. We cannot allow that a brutal authoritarian regime can invade an independent democratic country without consequences. And we cannot allow President Putin and his lags to dictate what kind of world we shall live in. Which is why Norway, the United States and other allies and, uh, and other countries now support Ukraine with arms, with medicines, with money, and other ways of military and civilian support. And we will continue to, to do so for as long as it takes. It's a paradox of history that parts of the international legal order, the um, edifice we established after the Second World War, were developed from experiences in today's Ukraine. The main architect behind the term crime against humanity, Herz Lauterbach, and one of the architects between, behind the genocide convention of 1948, Rafael Lemkin, both came from the Lviv area in today's Ukraine. Both were Jewish, and their family almost, uh, were almost wiped out during the Holocaust. They themselves experienced the horror of war up close before they fled. Now we again see millions of people on the run. Civilian apartment blocks, schools and hospitals that are bombed. We can see civil civilians tied up, tortured and killed. And we see mass graves that shock and we can hear the constant and blatant lies from the Russian regime lying to the world, lying to their own people. Russia is Norway's neighbor and a focus point for calibrating our foreign and security policy where we sh because we share 200 kilometers border with Russia in the high north. And we have done so for more than a thousand years without ever being at war. As far as I know, we are the only country bordering Russia by land which has never been to war 
with Russia. And after the Cold War, we established a cross-border cooperation on several levels. Ten years ago, more than 300,000 people crossed the border every year, bringing growth and economic activity to the high north region. Now, there is almost no activity. It is in Norway's interest to have a predictable and balanced relation to our big neighbor in the east, to cooperate where we can in areas of mutual interest. But today, that is not possible. So this week, I attended the United Nations General Assembly in New York, where obviously the war in Ukraine was in the agenda. So I'm pleased to note that we, our allies, and a large majority of the countries in the world today condemn Russia's brutal war and support Ukraine in their self-defense. We cannot sit silent and watch. We cannot allow President Putin to win this war. Did you know what Putin fears the most? It's democracy. It is the will of the people because democracy means freedom. It provides hope. It gives strength to the belief that a society can be corrected and also changed, that regimes can change for the good of every individual. In Putin and so-called strongman's worldview, Western democracies are weak. They think we have no future, that we are spineless and without morals. For many, this message hits home they see a strong man, maybe a model they themselves want to be. We see tendencies towards illiberal moves in several countries, also in Europe. And when democracies weaken, women's rights and queer people are often the first to be affected. Because the so-called strong men believe that with gender, or which, which gender and which orientation you have, should determine what opportunities you have in life. The fight for their rights is also, in my opinion, foreign policy. But democracies has proved resilient time and again throughout history. Individual freedom and democratic institutions have faced strong opposition, tried broken. And during the rise of communism and fascism in the 20s and the 30s, but democracy has Ended. And time and time again come back. Not because democracies are flawless or particularly efficient, but because the alternatives to democracy are much worse. People across all cultures and geographical affiliations do not want to live in dictatorship. They want freedom to be allowed to say what they want think what they, they want and have the opportunity to decide themselves what kind of lives they want to live. Because even if democracy as a system of governance has proven to be robust, it will wither if people are not willing to fight for it. Many like us who are grown up in a peaceful and prosperous democracies like United States or Norway, we take democracy for granted. Putin's war reminds us of what is at stake. While driving from Minneapolis into this great state of Iowa this morning, I noticed the writing inscribed in your flag. It says, our liberties will prize and our rights will be maintained. And it struck me that is exactly why we support Ukraine in this war, to prize their liberties and maintain the rights, not only for Ukrainians, but for all, their students and friends. Another key discussion in Norwegian foreign policy is over peace and reconciliation efforts around the globe. Our involvement has a humanitarian dimension to end human suffering and distress by creating peace. But it's also about something more, something beyond peace, because peace is a prerequisite for a democratic system of governance. The rules-based world order I mentioned earlier has one precondition, 
a largely peaceful world. Thus, peace is also in our self-interest. Our role often involves bringing parties in war and conflict together. We facilitate political dialogue so that the parties in a conflict may find political solutions. Our role depends on there being a realistic desire for a solution among the conflicting parties, which is not only the case. The parties are all often miles apart. They may not even recognize each other or as legitimate actors, which is why we seek to start from what unites rather than what divides. Any dialogue would start there in the recognition of common, I would say, interests. Be it in Venezuela, Afghanistan, Colombia, Nepal, the Philippines, or in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in the Middle East, which are some of the conflicts where Norway has been involved. Our position is that we talk to almost any party in a conflict if there are willingness to engage in a political dialogue. Any parties which is possible to engage. There are different, of course, opinion on, opinions on this approach. Norway has a very long tradition uh, because we, leave, we, we believe in dialogue, even if it presents us with some dilemmas, like having to talk to parties which whom we deeply, strongly disagree with, parties who might be responsible for horrible actions, like the Taliban, Hamas, or Hezbollah. But I sincerely do not believe that Afghanistan will be a better country for Afghans if we re uh, refuse to talk to the Taliban, despite the horrors they have caused. A view shared by Afghan civil society and human rights activists living in Afghanistan, and also a view shared by the chief of defense in Norway, General, uh, the Norwegian general, who has a highly decorated Afghanistan veteran himself. He deeply disagreed with the Taliban, but I don't think we should refuse to talk to, to, to them, he, he says. Because isolating authoritarian regimes could also bring them closer to each other, and this is not in our interest. The essence of what we do in our peace and reconciliation efforts is not to make the parties in a conflict agree with each other, but to make them understand each other better and show respect for each other's points of view. If the parties in a conflict achieve mutual understanding and respect, then a long step towards peace has been made. But it's very difficult when we often are being criticized and we often also fail. The 4th of November, it will be 20, eight years since the Israeli Prime Minister Itzhak Rabin was shot and killed during a public meeting in Tel Aviv. Some would argue that the Oslo Agreement died then. Died then. The, the agreement that was supposed to ensure peace between Israel and Palestine. Now there have been no real negotiations between the parties since 2014. The Palestinians have achieved neither independence nor sovereignty. All negotiation attempts have so far failed, and the conflict is characterized by terror, violence, and use of force. Norway has been involved in this conflict for more than 30 years, and we will continue to be engaged. Only a negotiated two-state solution will safeguard the security and dignity of both Israelis and Palestinians. And I visited the region um, some days ago, and my message both, both to Israeli and Palestinian leaders is that it is an urgent need to return to the negotiating table before it's too late. Dear friends, Luther's college mission statement is, as people of all backgrounds, we embrace diversity and challenge one another to learn in community to discern our callings and to serve with distinction for common good. I love this statement. I might copy that as a statement for Norwegian foreign policy. 
By education, I am an historian, and I know very well that history cannot predict what the future will bring or tell us what decision we should make today, because history never repeats itself. Every epoch is unique, but history can help us avoid doing the same mistakes as we had done before. And history is the weave that binds the past, the present, and the future together. And weave is also an old Norse word. You might know that, Dr. Johnson. Uh, the Norway that Lar La Larsen left in 1857 uh, does not longer exist, except in the fabric of history. And just as Norway is not longer the country Larsen left, Luther College is no longer the college he founded. We have both changed to, to the better, I would say, much thanks to increased diversity and knowledge. But we are still a part of the same fabric we are still images in the same wave. The wave which also contains pictures from Kabul in Afghanistan and the chaotic days of evacuation in January 2021. When everyone else had left, there were still troops left from two countries to pack up and finish, finish the job. Only two flags fluttering in the wind at the military base by the airport. The flag of the United States and that on, of Norway. Flags which were prohibited in Norway when Prime Minister, the Norwegian Prime Minister visited Luther College back in 1942. The Nazis forbade it and any celebration of, of a constitutional day, the 17th of May. On that day in 1942, the Prime Minister held a speech not so far from here in, in Minneapolis where he said that our saga tells us that personal freedom has always been a sacred thing, and that when attempts were made to violate this freedom, when tyranny and dictatorship gained the upper hand, people left Norway to build that future in other countries, but they never forgot Norway. Norwegian immigration to the Midwest is a part of our saga. Luther College is a part of our saga. And that saga continues in different ways and in different kind of, of world. So the Norwegian government highly values the close ties between Luther College and uh, Norway. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>